Good morning. Let's have our choir come. Good morning. We want to welcome you to Tri-State Baptist Temple today. We want to invite you to grab a hymn book and turn to hymn number 223. Hymn 223 and stand with us this morning as we, sit, as we sing Victory in Jesus. Thank 
Amen. You can be seated and we'll listen to our choir.
choir comes down, won't you stand with us and we'll fellowship together. You can be seated again this morning, and we are excited to be in the Lord's house, and we're thankful for a good day, and they already thankful for a good Sunday school hour that we've had, and looking forward to the preaching of God's Word here in just a little while, but uh, let us remind you about some things going on in the life of our church. We want to remind you that our Hallelujah Festival is this coming Tuesday, and we are very excited about our Hallelujah Festival. We have that every year, and uh, so many families and their children come uh, to our church and uh, spend time, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, come into our uh, uh, gym and play all these games we have set up. We'll have our the inflatable uh, in the gym, and uh, we'll have a, a hot dog dinner for every child that comes, and we'll have, uh, uh, we're hoping you will bring our soups and chilies and those things uh, for our adults to enjoy as well, and it's always a great night, a lot of fun, and it's an opportunity for us as a church to uh, share our church with the community and, and uh, share with them the love of Christ, and we want to uh, be an encouragement uh, to the families that come in, and uh, uh, we uh, pray that we'll have an opportunity to invite them to our services and share with them uh, how wonderful our Lord and Savior is. So I hope you're praying for our Hallelujah Festival and make plans to come and be a part of it. We uh, will have uh, lots of things that are going on and uh, we'll have things to, uh, you can help with. Uh, 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 we want people in our kitchen and working our games and all those kind of things. And we'll need uh, individuals to be there just to greet our guests that are with us and uh, spend some time talking to them and encouraging them. And so uh, we're uh, looking forward to it, and we hope uh, you'll be a part of that. Uh, we can still use candy if you want to bring in candy so we can use to give away at these games. Uh, bring candy in uh, tonight, or you can bring them in tomorrow if you want as well, and uh, that would be great. And uh, if you signed up to bring some of these items to help us with it, don't forget about that as well. And the sign-up sheet's standing right up here if you need to see it. Uh, you've forgotten what you've signed up for, those kind of things. Or if you want to add uh, something to it, uh, get that sign-up sheet and, uh, as well. And they're sitting right up here. But we are excited about the Hallelujah Festival and looking forward to it uh, uh, on Tuesday. Don't forget our missions revival is November the 4th to the 6th. So that's just uh, uh, coming up very quickly now as well. And we're looking forward to that. I want to encourage you to make plans to be at every night. Of the of our uh, missions revival and so uh, and it'll be uh, be good and uh, important uh, not uh, important meeting for our church so make sure you make plans to be at our missions revival as well and so we're just thankful for a great day uh, well, at this time we'll ask our men to come we'll take up our tithes offering faith promise missions offering.
Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Amen. Well, good morning to everyone today. It's a joy to see you here this morning. Appreciate good music and the choir doing a good job. Boy, the men were singing out on those bass parts today, weren't they? Uh, just a blessing, everybody doing their part. And listen, the choir is always open. If you'd like to go up and sing in the choir, go up there and sing. And uh, You don't have to audition or anything, all right? Just go up there and sing, and uh, that'd be a blessing. And uh, So we're thankful you're here today. God bless you for coming out. Hadn't it been a great weekend? Uh, been beautiful, and we're just thankful for the fall. And uh, I saw some pictures yesterday on the online uh, up around Snowshoe, the ski resort in Beckley. Snowed up there yesterday, and boy, it was beautiful. Uh, the the trees were all fall colored, and then they were just dusted with that snow. And boy, that was just really pretty. But right now, it's just real nice, like it is right here, isn't it? And so we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but. Uh, but uh, we're enjoying this. It's been a great weekend, and we're thankful for you being here. God bless you for coming out. Boy, it's a blessing to have Miss Phyllis back with us and, and, uh, and doing so much better. She's the bionic woman now, ready to go. And, uh, and, and I'm glad she's... Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and uh, we're glad to get her back to get Diane straightened up and uh, watch out for her. So. Uh, but uh, it's just a joy to have everybody here. Thank you for coming out <clears throat> and being a part of our services. It's been a good weekend, and it's going to be an exciting week. Our, our Kings Turf football program this year, you know, we prayed about launching this for a couple of years, just tried to find the right time, and, uh, and we got started this year. We don't have a lot of families, but we have several, and boy, it's been really, really a good ministry, and uh, our, our folks have uh, have done a good job with it, and uh, I think our families have enjoyed it. I believe the boys and girls just really like it, and uh, uh, so you pray for that, that it will grow. Uh, word of mouth will help it to grow, but we've been able to share the gospel. I, I, I'm thankful yesterday I could step out there on the, in the middle of that field and just preach the gospel, and uh, so it's exciting to be able to do that, and uh, we're thankful, and uh, so keep praying for that, but that was a good week, good way to Began, we began with a great men's breakfast yesterday, and uh, that was good. Had a good breakfast, had our King's Turf program, bus visiting, out and going, and now today. Tomorrow night's the ladies' Bible study, 6 o'clock. The ladies' Bible study's tomorrow evening. That's the last, that's the one in October, and uh, we're here to the end of the month, and so don't forget to be here for that. <clears throat> then our Hallelujah Festival is Tuesday night, and this is always a great opportunity for us to reach families in our community. And uh, don't forget, if you signed up to bring in some items for the hot dog dinner, uh, it would be great to have all that in by sometime tomorrow. That way on Tuesday, I'm not wondering, are we going to have enough? Or, or is it going to come? Will they bring it with them? And I'm not real good at that. I like to just have it all ready and have it all in place. Uh, so if you're planning on bringing things by, just bring them tonight or bring them by tomorrow anytime and we'll have all that. We can still use candy. If you haven't brought candy by, we can still use it. And uh, uh, we, uh, we always give away a lot of that. And uh, it's a great way for uh, you as a parent to have your child in a good environment where uh, they're not out knocking on doors in the neighborhood and all those kind of things. 
uh, that way they don't run into any scary clowns out there somewhere. And, uh, but uh, someone showed me a picture of Ronald McDonald. You know Ronald? And on the bottom of it, it said, these guys are going to get me killed with all these scary clowns. But anyway, uh, they can come here and be right in the building and uh, have a good, safe environment for them. Uh, and uh, we're looking for a great day. So pass the word along about that. Invite families and folks you know. If you have people you work with that have children, invite them to come. Uh, listen, this is an opportunity for us to reach the unreached, to, uh, to try to in, uh, influence the unchurched. And we want to get them here and get their information and get their addresses and names so we can follow up and visit. And so make it an opportunity. Uh, and then uh, we always have a great uh, soup and chili supper. Folks bring in pots of soup and chili and all those kind of things. And boy, it's a great, uh, a great night. So I hope you'll be a part of it. That's 6 o'clock to 7.30 on Tuesday evening, Wednesday night church. Uh, I gave our Bible college the week off. This is their fall break. Uh, on Thursday night, and they're happy because they are struggling with homework. It's been a, it's been a real work-intensive uh, semester. We're working our way through the book of Genesis, and we're not just surveying it. We're digging in there and really looking at it, and uh, lots of homework on that. And uh, So they're going to have a couple weeks to catch up, uh, but uh, we're thankful uh, for our classes. Uh, November is the month we've set aside for our Praying on Purpose focus on prayer, and uh, many of you signed up to participate in that in January during Vision Night, and the list, uh, the sign-up list is up here on the front pew. Uh, if you uh, did not sign up uh, uh, to participate in that, and you would like to, then just stop by up here and put your name on that list. Uh, I'm only going to print booklets for those who have signed up that want to participate, because uh, they're a pretty good-sized booklet, and we want to print them and have uh, one for everyone participating. Uh, the, the, the prayer focus, this purposeful prayer, is for the whole month. And in the booklet that you'll get, you're going to find that it all begins with personal prayer and preparation of our hearts to be in the place of prayer. And so you're going to find in that booklet the first week of this of this. Uh, of month, you're going to focus on your heart, the condition of your heart, your relationship with the Lord. You know, your relationship with the Lord is also contingent upon your relationship with other people. And so you're going to spend that week uh, each day with a portion of Scripture to, to, to read and some questions that I hope you'll truthfully answer to yourself. You don't have to ever show these to anybody else, but unless you're honest with the Lord, you're not going to profit any in this first week. But if you'll be honest with the Lord, you'll grow and you'll profit and you'll be in a place of prayer. Uh, and then we'll continue that focus every one of the weeks of November, going back and going through and re-going, uh, working through that first week. Then beginning the second week, we're going to have prayer meetings here at church, uh, sometimes before services, sometimes maybe taking time during the services. And we'll have, uh, we'll have places of prayer uh, dependent upon uh, groups of people. Uh, for instance, all the teenagers, you guys are going to have your own prayer group at that time. Uh, we're going to have a prayer group for parents that have children still in school, school-aged children. We have a prayer group just for you, and we're going to focus on prayer and what it means to pray being a, a parent with children in school. We'll have a prayer group for men, a prayer group for women, and we'll have places where you can meet, and we're just going to pray for a while. And uh, so uh, we'll do that beginning the second week, and then, we'll, then, then you'll be doing the first week of prayer over and over every week. And then once the second week starts and we have our prayer meetings, we'll be doing those the second week, the third week, and the last week. We'll keep those going, and then we'll culminate our uh, focus on prayer month with a 24-hour uh, prayer uh, vigil. And we're going to put together a, a sheet of paper and try to see if we can get folks in our church who are willing to be in prayer during every hour of a 24-hour period of time. You don't have to pray an hour, but you can be in prayer sometime during that hour. And uh, we, uh, we're going to focus on prayer. Uh, we'll be preaching on prayer and thinking about these things. So if you'd like to get involved in that, then just sign up on that sheet. So many other things. Uh, 
one of the most important things of the year is the first weekend in November, and that is our mission revival. Our mission revival. And Dr. Steve Cook is coming to speak. He's with Jewish End Time Missions. Uh, he has a heart for reaching Jewish people around the world with the gospel. He leads groups of people to Israel several times a year. And now a great an open door in, in Cuba. There is a large number of Jewish people in Cuba. And he leads groups of people down there. They're seeing hundreds of people saved. Uh, and uh, he's going to be preaching for us with a focus on prophecy, uh, end time prophecy. If there's anything that ought to uh, put a, a, a burden upon our heart to reach lost people now more than ever, it's the fact that we're closer now to the Lord returning than we ever have been before. Bible prophecy and evangelism are something that go hand in hand. And we need to work while the day is here, aren't we? And, and we know that that day of the Lord is coming very soon. So he'll be preaching for us. And then we've got a wonderful family, the Lockharts, who've been our missionaries in Mexico City for years, doing a great job. They'll be here. They haven't been here for 16 years. And uh, so it'll be good to have them home to give a report and to meet them. They'll be involved in our meetings. Don't forget, we do Friday evening. We do a Saturday morning brunch, kind of breakfast lunch. And then we'll have services all day on Sunday. Uh, we'll have special times where we uh, uh, kind of interact with our missionaries that are visiting with us in the meeting. Uh, but more than anything, be praying for it and be praying that we will all just increase our faith that we can give more this year for missions than we ever had before. We've had so many great missionaries come through our church and ministries and uh, so many that we that we would love to be able to invest in. And uh, we need to grow in our mission giving. So that's an important thing. And then there's a little card in your bulletin today. I noticed that we're going to have a fellowship after church tonight. And uh, it says cake. It says ice cream. And it says bring in food. So if that's all true, I'll be there for sure. And uh, so I hope you'll come to church tonight and stay for that. Our children are practicing their Christmas program and uh, I tell you what, they are so effective in sharing the Christmas message through these programs. It's a great way to get your family involved in uh, coming to church. Maybe they're out of church or don't attend. Uh, you can use the program as a way to get them here to hear the gospel and see your children and get to know a little bit about our church and ministry. Uh, so parents, if you have preschool or elementary school age children, we can't encourage you enough, number one, just to be in church on Sunday night. Uh, it's so important. Because we need you. We need your families here. We use your children every Sunday night in the service. And uh, we use them to help take up a very special offering that I can't take up any other way. i got to have them. And, uh, and I don't want to miss taking up an offering, all right? So I'm depending on you uh, to have your children in church. And uh, then they're practicing their program now on Sunday evenings. And that'll be a blessing. Uh, so many good things this time of year. But we're glad you're here. Why don't you take your Bibles this morning and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first of the two letters that, that the Holy Spirit gave to the Apostle Paul to write to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to begin to read in verse 6. The message this morning is laborers together with God. There's, there's really no way to express what being saved truly means, the magnitude to, of knowing that we're saved, knowing that we're born again, knowing that once we were lost, separated from God, we were condemned to a Christless eternity of suffering because of our sin debt, and we were deserving of that. But to think that God, in love, gave us His only begotten Son. He sent His own perfect Son into the world to suffer for us, to take our place and die the death that we deserve to die, to be forsaken of the Father so that we might not have to be forsaken, that we might have forgiveness of sin, and we might have eternal life, the hope of a home in heaven. There's really no way we can ever adequately describe what that means, the magnitude of it, I know we should never get over it, should we? We should relive that every day. But I've always felt that equally important and equally unspeakable is the privilege we have of serving Jesus Christ, of being involved in the work of the Lord. You know, we live finite lives in this world. We're born 
and it's appointed unto men once to die. And we live and we die. And men live and die without the Lord. And they enter eternity without the Lord. And they've missed the greatest opportunity of life, and that's to receive Christ. And other men live their life and die and go into eternity. And they never lived for those things that will go beyond this life. They never live for the eternal, never live for the things uh, that will make a difference a million years from now. But when we understand that we have the privilege of being a laborer together with God, we understand that what we're then investing and in giving our life for will mean something a thousand years from now. It will not have been as if we have never lived. It will make a difference. And so what a privilege to be a co-laborer, a laborer together with God. And, uh, and so we're looking at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice in verse 6, verse 6, Paul's writing, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planted and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye, ye are God's husbandry. The word husbandry literally means in the Greek language a farmer. We are God's farmers. And we're to be sowing the seed, aren't we? Sowing the seed. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder... I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, it, uh, declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let's stop there, but notice in verse 9 the phrase, for we are laborers together with God. Laborers together with God. I want you to think about that with me today. We're thinking about missions coming up. We're thinking about globally reaching lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ, together we can be involved in that work. That's God's work. And we can have a part in it. We can all be, to, be together in working with God to reach the lost. And that's what I want for our lives and for our church and for your family. But let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for a great day. We thank you for, Lord, allowing us to be together today just like we are. And folks that uh, Lord, uh, have gone through some trials here. They're back in their places. And Lord, we thank you for the children that are here today. And Lord, some of those children that we're ministering to today, their families, Lord, they're not in church and they're not thinking about the things of God. They're not thinking about eternity, not thinking about salvation. And so, Lord, may these children become keys to open up the doors of parents' lives and hearts. Lord, may each of us that are here together today Lord, may we think about what a privilege it is to know you as our Savior, to be saved today. Lord, we thank you that there's a reality, God, about that, that we ought to live in every day. But Lord, help us not to, not to uh, Lord, to downplay how wonderful it is to be able to labor together with you, God. You're doing a work in this world. Lord, you, you're involved in the lives of men. God, uh, there's so much suffering and, Lord, there's so much uh, violence and so many uh, things, God, that are, that, are, uh, that are causing so much pain. But God, you've sent your Son to give hope, to provide salvation, to give eternal life, Lord, beyond this life. And so, Lord, we thank you that you're involved in this uh, work in the world and that we can, we can join you in that work. And, Lord, our lives can make a difference uh, in eternity. So speak to us about these things each of us at our place of understanding and faith and help us to act and live by faith and move forward by faith. 
And Lord, we pray if someone's come to church, but they've never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that God, today, by grace, you would settle upon their heart a great sense of the reality of sin. God, that without you, they're lost, and that God, to be lost is to be without hope. And so, Lord, today, give them hope and show them the light of Christ and lead them to yourself. And God, may all of us that know you be obedient to you uh, together today as, Lord, you speak to our hearts. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, when we think about what we know and what we find in the New Testament, we know that the Apostle Paul, along with a man named Barnabas, were the first missionaries sent out of a New Testament local church. We read about that in Acts 13 in the church at Antioch. God called Saul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, to be missionaries, and the church set them aside and sent them forth. They became the first missionaries that we read about in the New Testament. On the second missionary term of the Apostle Paul, he came to a city named Corinth. Corinth is in what we know today as Turkey, or in Greece, in modern Greece. There's a city, Corinth, the Corinth that we would have found in the New Testament. And uh, somewhere around A.D. 52, the Apostle Paul, after preaching and sharing the gospel, established a church there. He planted a local New Testament church in the city of Corinth. Later, he had moved on to the city of Ephesus. And uh, he spent some time in Ephesus where he did the same thing. He preached the gospel. People got saved. He taught them and led them in the doctrines of the apostles. He established a church, and he stayed till that church got on its feet. But while he was in Ephesus... He heard of some things that were taking place back in the church in Corinth. There were some problems in the church, and there were some questions among the members about the right way to do some things. And so we find 1st and 2nd Corinthians in our Bible. And in these letters, Paul deals with several different issues. Uh, they were struggling with pride in the church. They were struggling with some pride issues. The, they, the pride of the people had brought divisions within the church. It had separated the church. And you remember, uh, some of them were boasting upon their spiritual heritage. Well, it was Paul that led me to Christ. Well, it was Apollos that led me to Christ. And they were boasting about, you know, uh, their spiritual lineage. And, and this was causing some divisions. And there was also some false doctrine being taught in the church. There was confusion about the spiritual gifts about speaking in tongues and some of these things. There was confusion about the church ordinances. They had, they had created and perverted the Lord's Supper among some things and were not, not observing the Lord's Supper in a scriptural way. So there were some things that were going on. But overall, there was a general spiritual immaturity in the church. These, these problems were hindering their spiritual growth. Paul wrote to him. You remember he said, I, I, I'm having to write unto you as babes in Christ, uh, as carnal and not spiritual. And uh, so there were a lot of things that should be a part of the lives of the people in Corinth as growing and maturing believers that were absent. They were missing because they weren't growing. The one thing that we know, and there's so many things that leads to spiritual maturity, areas of life where we really begin to grow up in the Lord when we get a grasp on these things. But one of those things that leads to spiritual maturity is when we recognize that we have to be completely dependent upon Jesus Christ to accomplish anything in the spiritual work of God. We cannot do the work of God in the power and energy of the flesh. We cannot do it. It is a spiritual work. And until we come to that place where we recognize that we are totally dependent upon Christ to get the work of God done, we're not going to grow and move forward. And so they had to learn this. You know, the church, we're studying church history in our Bible college classes this semester. The church, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, upon this rock, He said, upon Myself, I'm going to build the church. The church, the church belongs to Jesus Christ. The work of building the church is the work of Jesus Christ. It's His work. And you know what? He's given His Spirit, the Spirit of God, to every born-again believer. And the Spirit of God in your life will work through your surrendered life to do the work of God. It won't be you. It'll be Him. It'll be Him in you doing that work. 
And by the way, I hope you come back tonight. I'm going to preach from Galatians 2.20 where Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And we're going to talk about that very thing. Are we surrendered? And is Christ living through us? Or are we living a self-life? Because that depends on uh, what the answer to that makes the difference in everything, doesn't it? But, but Paul here, we're understanding that if we will surrender our life to the Spirit of God, we can be a worker together with God. We can be a labor together in the work of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, this is what Paul's reminding them about. And you know, there's times we need reminded about many of the spiritual truths we have in God's Word. We just need reminded about it. And we can, never, we can never accomplish the work of the Lord without Him. We can't ever do it without being Spirit-filled people. We'll not grow or move forward in the church or in our own lives spiritually until we realize we have to surrender it all. We have to give all we are and have to the Spirit of the Lord and live by faith in Him. We can witness all we want to witness. We can invite as many people to church as we want to invite. We can pass out tracts to the lost. We can teach in classes and work in ministries. But without the power of God, through the Spirit of God, the work will not be fruitful. It will not be fruitful. God is faithful. God is faithful. God wants us to be fruitful. In, in John chapter 15, he talks all about it. He says, I, I, I've saved you uh, that you might bear fruit, that you might bear much fruit, that it might be fruit that remains. And he's talking about spiritual fruit. But you remember what he told the disciples? You must abide in me. Abide in me. And let me abide in you. And then he said, because what? He said, because without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. But God is faithful and God is able and God will do His work. And we must do our part as the people of God. Say, Pastor, what can I do? Surrender. Surrender all to Him. That's what our part is. Turn our life over to Him. Let Him lead and guide our lives. Have control. Have the leadership by His Spirit working in our lives. And that will move the work of God forward. You know, we cannot do the work of the Lord it is God's work, but we can work with Jesus Christ through His Spirit, doing His work, and being used of Him. We can't do it, but we can help Him do it. We can be a worker together with Him. Verse number 9, For we are laborers together with God. He's laboring. He's doing a work. His work is an eternal work. We can never do an eternal work unless we surrender to the Spirit of God and be a worker together with God. Each one of us who are born again and saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ, we've been saved for the purpose of living for and laboring with Jesus Christ. This is what we're saved for. We've not been saved to sit. We've not been saved to spend our lives on the things of this world, but to serve and invest them working together with God to accomplish His work in the world. Let me show you these three simple things. Number one, Verse number 9 helps us to understand that we all are a servant. We all are a servant. Notice he said, for we are laborers together with God. We are laborers. We are laborers. There's a simple truth here, but it's too important to overlook. All of us that know Jesus Christ as our Savior, whether you're a teenager tonight, uh, today, or the oldest folk, folk in the building, all of us are servants if we're in Christ. All are to labor with Jesus Christ. We're to do it through the Spirit of God, surrendering to Him to move the work of God forward in the world. We're to be laborers, laboring with Jesus Christ. Church that was in Thessalonica, the church that was in Thessalonica, Paul wrote to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And he said, Paul and Salvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, he said, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And then he says in verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. Paul said, I, I don't, I, 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 I've still not gotten over it. Paul said, I, I pray every day and thank the Lord for what I saw in your church. How I saw you working together by faith 
laboring, but laboring in love with God to accomplish His work. Paul said, I, I still not forgot it. I, I thank the Lord every day for it. And Paul saw the labor of love there being done in Thessalonica. Paul saw it. And you know what? God knows and sees it in our lives. Or the, la or the lack of it. Not, not just Sundays, <clears throat> but God sees that labor of love on Monday. He sees it on Friday. Every day of the week, laboring with God, laboring in the work of God. He sees it each day, everywhere we are, laboring with Jesus Christ for the glory of Christ from a heart of love for what He's done for us. He sees that. And this is the work of the Lord. This is what Jesus Christ came to do. Luke 19.10 said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why He came into the world. This was the work that He came to do. And all of us are to be servants. All of us are to be laboring with Him to reach the lost and see them saved. All of us who are saved are to plan and prepare and live and labor and seek out the lost and bring them to Christ. This is what God did. God had a plan before the world was that He would send His Son and He prepared. And when the fullness of time was come, He sent His Son and He went into the world to reach the lost and to save them. And we're to plan and pray and we're to prepare and we're to live and labor to seek the lost and bring them to Christ. And in this work, in this labor, we are to continue on faithfully. Faithfully. When you come to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One of the last things Paul says to the church is in verse 58. He said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. And then he said this, For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you are laboring together with God, to accomplish His work, when your life consists of planning and praying and preparing and, and, and reaching out and laboring in the work of God in this world, your labor is not in vain. Listen, there's so many people laboring in the world today. They're laboring in the world for the things of the world, in the power of the world, and they may seemingly be doing it in a profitable way, because they keep getting, gaining, and accumulating the things of the world. You know what's going to happen someday? The Bible said that God has set this world and all that's in it. He's reserved it for judgment, and He's going to, he's going to, uh, he's going to dissolve this world and all the works of this world. They're going to be burnt up and destroyed, aren't they, someday? And there's so many people living and laboring and working, but it's in vain. But he said, listen, if you're a co-laborer with God, you're working to serve the Lord and get the work of God done in the world with your life, that's a labor that's not in vain. Because in eternity, it's going to make a difference. In eternity, it will make a difference. It will mean something. We have a purpose statement here at our church. I try to always review it. In January, during Vision Month, we keep it before you. Can anybody find our vision purpose statement? <laughs> I think it's right in front of your eyes on all of these posters and in your bulletin to, to glorify, to grow, and to go. And every January, I set that forth. This is our purpose statement of our church. Pastor, why are we here? We're here to glorify God, aren't we? We're here to glorify Him and all we are and all we do. Whatsoever we do, do all for the glory of God. Everything we do here is to be done for the glory of God. And then we're to grow in our spiritual lives. Paul said that we're to add to our faith virtue and patience and temperance and all the things that help us grow up into the likeness of Jesus Christ so that we can uh, serve Him as a true Christian and we can let Christ be seen through us and exalt Him and lift Him up. We grow by the Word of God. We grow by faith. We're to grow in our prayer life, in our, in our faithfulness and devotion to the Lord. We're to grow so that we can glorify Him, so that we can go. And what are we to do, Pastor? We're to be a, a labor together with God, aren't we? This is our purpose. This is what we do. It ought always to be that we're growing in our devotion and in our affection for Jesus Christ, growing in our spiritual lives so that we can reach the lost and glorify Jesus Christ. We pray, we plan, we preach, we teach. The things I do, we do to help you to grow 
so that you can glorify God and go and be involved in the work of God. This is what we're doing. And all we are together, we're to be servants with one another, laboring with Jesus Christ. Are you praying? Are you praying about these things? Are you planning, preparing, doing your part? Have you found your place in the work of God? In Matthew 28, Jesus told His disciples in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Jesus said, Amen. We have the promise of Jesus Christ that He has all power, all power, and that as we move forward in life with the purpose of working together with God, that He'll always be with us. And there will always be the power to accomplish His work when our life's work becomes His work. There's the power and presence of Christ for us to see that to see that accomplished and see it get done. Are you by faith allowing Him to use you? Have you surrendered all you are and have to Him? God will do His work and He'll use you. We're all servants. We're to all be servants. But notice number two, we all are not only to be servants, but we're to be serving. We all are to serve. Verse number 10 He gives an illustration. He says in verse 10, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let him take heed, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Now he's talking about a couple things here. Paul's talking about what he mentioned in verse 5. Paul said, When I came in there, he said, I planted the seed. I planted the seed of the gospel. I preached the gospel to some of you, and some of them got saved. Others did not, but Paul planted the seed of the gospel. But then when Apollos came to Corinth, Apollos began to, 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 to serve the Lord. And you know what he did? He preached and taught, and the word was already sown. Paul had sown it, but through his preaching and teaching, he just came along and watered it a little bit until then it finally brought forth the fruit of salvation in some people's lives. And Paul said, I laid a foundation. Another came and built upon it, and now, now you are your own building of God laid on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So now give heed about how you begin to build your life. How you begin to build your life. And Paul begins to give an illustration here. See, we're to build our lives on the foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. This is where it all begins. If you're here today and there's never been a time and a place in your life when you've been born again by faith in Jesus Christ, then let me say, you're most likely without Jesus Christ. You're most likely still in your sin debt. You're still unlikely, uh, most likely unforgiven for your sins and separated from God. And when you leave this world, you're going to enter a Christless eternity. But you begin to build your life spiritually on the foundation of your faith in Christ. There's got to be a time and place in your life, just like the day you were born into the world, when you're born again by faith in Jesus Christ. You confess you've sinned. Your sin sent the Lord to the cross, just like mine did. And He suffered because of me. He suffered because of you. And we ask God to forgive us. We put our faith and trust that Christ died to save us and lives again and satisfies God on our behalf. And then from that point forward, we begin now to have the opportunity of building a life. And are we going to build that life for the world and the things of the world? Or are we going to be a labor together with God and build it for eternity? And that's the question that we have. And we're all to serve the Lord. God has given us the material we need to build our lives so that together we can serve Him. He's given us the materials to build a life that will glorify Him. He's given us the materials to build a life growing, growing spiritually, and going and accomplishing the work of God. He's given us materials to do that. In Acts chapter 20, Paul wrote about the church in Ephesus, and he said in verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all them which are sanctified. See, we're building in this life so that someday when we enter eternity, we'll see then that our labor was not in vain, that our life made a difference, that we have there a heavenly treasure laid up for us that came from 
serving and living for the Lord in this life. We may serve the Lord and live and labor in this world and never truly ever understand how our life lived in laboring for Christ really made a difference. We may never see it in this life. But someday in eternity, we'll know. We'll know. Because God sees and God knows and someday God's going to let us, let us know that it was not in vain. It wasn't in vain. But we may never know till then. But we can labor faithfully knowing that we can have an inheritance. But watch, notice what Paul said, will enable us to build a life that lays up an inheritance. You notice he says, the word of the grace of God. God's grace. God has given us His grace. And by His grace, we can see our lives laboring and working together with God make a difference in eternity. All of us. All of us can do it. Through the grace of God. God has given us His grace. Grace to build our lives upon. Grace so that we can labor together with Christ. At all times, through all circumstances and situations, God's grace will always be sufficient for us so that we can keep growing and building and working and serving the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, But by the grace of God, Paul said, I am what I am. But by the grace of God, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Paul said, But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. That's really what did the work. God's grace. God said, Paul said, I've not, I've not let it be in vain, but I've tapped in by faith to the grace of God and I've let it build me and keep moving me forward so that I can accomplish something for the Lord. God has given us His grace. We can be what God would have us to be by His grace. Grace is so great because grace is not based on our merit. It's not based on what we deserve. It's based on the, on, the, on, the, on the favor of God given toward us. Uh, it, is, it is God's gifts given to us, not because we earn them or deserve them, because He loves us and wants to give them to us. And so we can be the people God would have us to be by His grace. It's not, it's not when I think about this thing that I, that I have to say, well, I can't do that. And it's not that I, I have to look at this thing about living for the Lord and making a difference and, I, and say, well, I don't have this ability or that or I don't have this resource or that. No, that's not the way we look at it. We look at it and say, God's grace is sufficient. And God, whatever you would have me to do, you'll give me the grace to accomplish it. God, whatever it is you've, you've called me to, uh, to serve you in, You'll, you'll give me what I need to do it. God's grace is sufficient. He gives us what we don't deserve. He'll give us grace. He'll give us the grace to go. Uh, he'll give us the grace to live for Him, to give to support the work of God. He'll give us grace at home. He'll give us grace on our jobs. He'll give us grace in the church. God will give you grace. And through His sufficient grace, you'll be able to do whatever you need to do to live a life where you can be a co-worker and a worker together with God. God will give you the grace to do it. Listen, God will give you the grace in your home, you men, to treat your wives like you should. We need the grace of God to do that. To esteem them and love them, honor them, be the man of God we ought to be for them. And you men and women who have children home, God will give you the grace as parents to raise your children as you should. You need grace to do that today. God will give you that grace. He'll give you the grace to help reach the lost. You say, Pastor, I'm shy. I'm backward. I can't talk to people or I'm ashamed to pass out a track. No, if, if, you're, if you'll surrender, God will give you the grace and you can do it. You can do it. God will give you that grace. Uh, he'll give you grace to have compassion on your brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and, uh, and uh, help lift them up and and to minister to them. We will be and do what we do by the grace of God, and we can do all things through Christ. He'll give us the grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse number 8, he said, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound, and notice what he said, to every good work. And the good work is the work of God. And God said, I'll give you grace. I'll give you grace so that you can't, you, you, you're not only going to be involved in it, you're going to abound in it. You can abound in the work that, uh, 
that you can do with me if you'll just receive my grace. All the good works God has saved you to do, you can do them when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And as a Spirit-filled person, you'll receive the grace of God to do them. You can all serve. We're all servants. We can all serve. We can all work together for God. And it's not on who and what I'm not and what I don't have. It's all based on who God is and all God's sufficiency. And He'll give us grace. We just surrender. We just say, Lord, this is what, this is what, I, what I want to do. I want to be involved in Your work. I want to serve You. Then notice in verses 10 and 11 there again, he talks about the foundation of Christ for our life. He's our foundation for salvation. He's our foundation for service. We can work with God because we're on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He is in us. Ephesians 3.20 says He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And this is where we're standing as we think about serving Him. So we all are servants and we all are to serve Him. But thirdly, notice there will be a day when all will stand. All will stand. Sometimes we may think when we're working together with God, what's the use to do this? What's the use to surrender, to give to the Lord, to sacrifice? No one sees it, no one knows it, no one cares about it. Sometimes we may think that way. And it may be true of men. It may be true. But sometimes men just don't see it, do we? We just don't see it. But I tell you, it's not true of God because God sees and God knows and someday God will reward. In verse 12, the Bible said, now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, God begins to help us to see that He knows and someday every born-again believer will stand before Him and His life since He was saved will be examined. That's what this passage of Scripture is all about here. The day that all the people of God will stand before Jesus Christ. This is what we call the judgment seat of Christ, isn't it? the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not, see, see, this is not about my sin debt that separated me from God. This is not about that. See, my sin debt was judged in Jesus Christ on the cross. God judged my sin debt in His own Son, and His own Son paid that debt for me. So this judgment seat of Christ that we'll all stand at someday, is not, it's not about that. It's not about my sin debt that condemned me to hell uh, that I'll stand in judgment of at that day. It's not, it's not about, you know, if I'm saved or if I'm lost. It, it will only be saved people at the judgment seat of Christ. And what he's going to do is examine my life and how I've built my life and how I've lived it since I was saved. That's what he's going to look at. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says this again. He said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things, notice what it says, done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing, knowing therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In other words, knowing that someday I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ and He's going to examine my life since I was saved to see what I lived it for, to see what I invested it in, to see what I, uh, what I uh, did with it, what I worked for. Was I working to glorify? Was I working in my growing? Was I working in my going for the eternal things, for the work of God? Or was I doing it for the flesh and the things of the world? And He said, in that day, uh, that day uh, we're going to, all of those things, He said, we we are all made manifest unto God. God sees and God's going to know it all. And he said, and he said, listen, knowing that, we ought to persuade men for Christ. This is what we ought to be doing. It's what our life ought to be doing. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, when you stand there, it's not going to be whether we're saved or lost. We wouldn't be there if we weren't saved. But it will be how well I served Him. It will be what I worked for. How completely I surrendered to Him and labored with Him to further His work. Verse 13 says there, notice, every man's work shall be made manifest. 
manifest, meaning, meaning declared, meaning made visible. Every man's work will be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work. Notice the phrase, of what sort it is. What sort it is. How could you say that simply? Is it eternal or was it, was it temporal? Was it of eternity or was it of the earth? Was it in the spiritual work of the Lord or was it in self and for self? It's going to be revealed what sort it was. The sort that is the work of God, that is the eternal things of God, that's the gold and the silver and the precious stones. The things that are of the world, the things that were of the self and the flesh, that's the wood, hay, and the stubble. And it'll be determined and revealed there that day what it was. Every man's work, our labor, our work, our life's work will be made manifest. Was it of the self? Was it of self or was it for the Savior? Was it of earth or was it of eternal things? It will be revealed with fire. I think he's giving us an illustration, kind of making a, 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 a visual picture for us. I believe he'll examine us by his word. By his word. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a, a purifying thing, his word. And the idea here is, is you use fire to purify things. Isn't it? It's a means of purifying. You boiled your baby bottles. You remember doing that? Glass bottles, all those kind of things. Boy, then, what was that company that came out with them little plastic baggies you dropped down inside those plastic bottles? Boy, that was a revolution, wasn't it? <clears throat> you purify when you can things with heat and fire. The metallurgist purifies raw elements like gold and silver with fire so that the Things that are impure rise to the surface and they're skimmed off and you're left with the pure. Fire it purifies. We'll be tried with fire. I believe His Word is a fire that reveals the truth. It says all things are naked and open to Him with whom we have to do. His Word is a, is a sword that pierces even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. It knows the very motives of our heart for why we do what we do. It will be made manifest. What motivated us? What we served and labored for. Did we do it with gratitude? Did we do it with thanksgiving toward God? God's going to see and know it all. And the day shall declare it. Daniel Webster, some of you heard of him. He was a United States senator. And he was the secretary of state to two different presidents. He made this statement. He said, the most important thought that ever occupied my mind is that of my individual responsibility to God he said that's the greatest thought that I ever thought about in my life is that someday I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 Paul wrote to the church at Rome but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set it not thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ part of my purpose as a pastor is to help you be ready for that day you say pastor never lets up He's always hard on us. He's always encouraged us to do more, give more, surrender more, seek more souls, give more mission offering, visit more, involve more. He's always doing that. Why won't he let up? Because I want to help prepare you for that day. Because someday you're going to stand there. And not only will the Lord examine what we could, what we did do, but he'll examine what we could have done. If we'll just surrender, if we'll just work for him, this church and all we do, we do in part so that, so that we'll have an opportunity so that when we stand before the Lord, we'll be ready. We'll be ready to stand before Him. Notice verse 14. If any man's work abide, any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, does it abide? The idea of abiding has the idea of, of, of being uh, ongoing. When I think about this, I think faithfulness. Faithfulness is an ongoing, enduring thing. Have we done what we did faithfully unto the Lord by the grace of God? Listen, today you can be a faithful servant. You can be a laborer together with God, furthering His work in the world. This is God's plan and purpose for every one of you that know Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you stand there someday before the Lord, you can be rewarded. 
you can be. You can be rewarded for a life given to working together with God, furthering the work of the Lord, doing those things which make a difference in eternity. You can, you can, you can be rewarded. Let me just give you these things quickly. I think they'd be of interest to you. There are five crowns or rewards we find mentioned in the Bible. We say, what kind of way will we be rewarded, Pastor, at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, from what I can read in the Bible, they'll be, you'll be given a crown, a crown as a token of reward. And there are five different kinds that you might win, that you might be rewarded with. Number one, there's the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 8. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that also love his appearing. So you could win the crown of righteousness. You say, Pastor, what's it for? What's well, for faithfully living your life like Jesus Christ could come at any moment. Isn't that what he says? He says, it's for those who loved my appearing. Listen, when you love something, you live and long to see it. And every day you get up, you, you live in anticipation of getting to see that. And for the crown of righteousness, every day we get up, we have to love the Lord and think today's the day He may come again. I can't wait. I hope He comes today. But if He comes today, I want to be ready. There's people I've worked with for years and I've never told them I'm a Christian, never ask about their soul. There's people who live on my neighborhood. They've never known me to ever go by and knock on their door and invite them to church. But the Lord could come today and I want to be ready, so I need to do these things. I need to get involved in the work of God. Those that love His appearing live every day like He's coming that day. That's the crown of righteousness. Number two is the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. This is a good one. This is, this is for souls. This is for souls led to Jesus Christ and pulled out of the fire who will someday be in heaven because of your surrender, your labor with Jesus Christ to seek them and see them saved. What is this all about? This crown of rejoicing. Paul said, he says, I'll tell you what is my joy. I'll tell you what I hope for when I get to heaven. He said, it's going to be you that God used me to lead to Jesus Christ. Sometimes this is called the soul winner's crown. We, we say this, but it's true. There'll be people in heaven that maybe we never met physically in this world, but we had a part in their salvation because we were actively working together with God to seek them and, and to win the lost. We're going to have our missionary, the Lockhart's here in a couple weeks, and they've been in Mexico for years. They've seen people saved in Mexico. People say... People will be in eternity because they surrender their life to go work with God. Heaven will be different because they serve God. Why? Because they preached the gospel, sought the lost, saw them saved, and that person now who was on their way to hell now will be in heaven. That's because they were workers together with God. But you know what? You who have given faithfully to support missions at this church every month, you also will get part of that reward because God knows every dime you gave to support missionaries, every soul they've seen saved, that also goes on your account because you've been working together with God to seek them. You've been working together to support those God has called to go. And so souls will be in heaven someday because of your labor and that's how we win the crown of rejoicing. Paul said, I'll tell you what my joy and hope is. It's, it's you, he said. You who will now be in heaven someday. And uh, that's the crown of rejoicing. Number three, the crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 4, when the, great, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. A crown of glory. Now, this particular crown, we believe, is reserved for pastors Pastors, men who have faithfully shepherded the sheep. 
faithfully shepherd the sheep. And listen, by the way, it's not based upon the judgment of men. Thank God for that. But it's based upon the judgment of God, isn't it? How God has seen a man faithfully preach and pray and try to get his people ready to meet Jesus Christ and reach souls with the gospel. The crown of glory. And then, fourthly, the crown of corruption. Or, or the crown of incorruption. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race all, run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. The crown of incorruption. This is for serving others as Jesus Christ has served you. It's for esteeming others as if they were Jesus Christ Himself. When you do something for someone else out of a heart of grace and compassion, you're doing the same as if you were doing it under Jesus Christ. When we treat other people and value them as Jesus Christ did, this is laying up treasure for a crown of incorruption. And the last one is the crown of life. James 1 verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now this is another crown we believe is a special crown. We believe it's those for those who were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, it came down to the point where it was either their life physically in this world or renouncing faith in Jesus Christ and they chose to die by faith in Him. You say, well, Pastor, that was a long time ago. Listen, there are still people dying for their faith every day in our world today. Every day in our world, people die for sake of Christ, for the cause of Christ. They're going to receive a crown of life. Now, 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 we look at life and we think things are unfair. And they are. But you know, then, then, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, all things will be made fair. All things will be made fair. If you're not saved, there's also a judgment where you will stand. If you're here today and you're unsaved, there's another judgment. You'll not be at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be at a place called the great white throne judgment. In, Gen in Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says in verse 11, And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it. Who's going to sit on that throne? Jesus Christ. Notice what it said, From whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Listen, the person sitting on that throne, the great white throne, is so righteous and holy that heaven and earth fear to even look upon Him and they flee. They flee. But it's at that place that every unsaved individual who's ever been conceived, born, lived, and died on planet earth, they're going to stand at the great white throne judgment. If you're here today and you're unsaved and you're lost, you'll not be at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll stand at the great white throne judgment. The Bible said the dead there will be judged out of the books and the books of life will be opened. And The Bible said the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. This is separation from God for eternity. Pastor, why would God send someone there? Why would God do that? Listen, please. God is not doing that. God is not doing that. We are doing it through unrepentant hearts. We are doing it because we will not ask Him to forgive our sins and save us. And so our own sin sends us to that place. God sent a Savior. God sent someone who delivers all men from that place if they'll put their faith and trust in Him. But there's nowhere else left for the lost to spend eternity. They can't spend it in heaven. And so they'll spend it in a place called the lake of fire. And that's where you'll spend eternity if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. But He gave Himself for you. He, he'll save you and forgive you today.
workers together with God, laborers together with God. Isn't it wonderful that we can work together to keep men and women, boys and girls, from going to that place? And this is what our life is all about. This is what it's all about, surrendering it to Him. And by His grace and through His Spirit and by the power of Christ, we can do this work. We can accomplish it as we do it by faith in Him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. In a moment, we'll stand together and we'll sing a verse of an invitation song. But you may be here today and God's been speaking to your heart. He spoke to your heart today about salvation. You have no assurance today. If you died, you'd go to heaven. You say, Pastor, I don't know about all this stuff. I, I, I've never had anybody take a Bible and show me from the Bible what the wages of sin is and why it's death and why Jesus Christ is God's gift for salvation and forgiveness of sin. I don't know about these things, but I know today I died today I don't know and I don't have the assurance that I would go to heaven maybe there's someone teenager a husband a father mother wife you'd be honest enough today to just raise your hand and say I don't know about these things I've never had anybody take a Bible and show me pastor from the scripture how I can know I'm saved but I can tell you I've got questions and I can tell you I don't have all the answers and I can I can tell you today, Pastor, that it seems like sometimes it's all in vain. Listen, God wants you to know today that there is a Savior. There is a heaven. There is a reason and purpose for life in this world. And there's, a, there's forgiveness for your sin debt. There's help in Christ and His Spirit, His Word. Maybe you're here today. You say, Pastor, I'd like for someone to Pray for me about this. I'm not sure about these things. Would anybody just slip your hand up and hold it for a moment? I'd like somebody, Pastor, maybe take a Bible today. I'd like to have someone show me from the Bible what I can do to be saved. How about you say, Pastor, after the service is over, I'd like for someone to take the Bible. I won't embarrass you. I don't want to embarrass you. After the service is over, would you just look for me? Because I'd like for someone to take the Bible and show me how I can be saved. Listen, even if you rode a bus or a van to church, that's all right. Well, someone will get you home. Don't worry about that. We'll get you there. But you say, I'd like to meet with you after the service. I'd like to know more about this. Would someone be honest enough to do that? Just let me know how to proceed today. Just lift your hand up and let me see it. I'd like to meet with you for a minute after the service, Pastor, to know how I can be saved. Thank you. Somebody else? Anybody else? We'll be sure to get you home if we need to. I just want somebody to take a Bible and show me how to... Thank you. Now what I'm going to do is I won't embarrass you, but I'm going to come to you. I'm not going to forget you, okay? And I'm going to find you right after the service is over. We'll talk about it. Maybe you're here today. God's speaking to your heart about a worker together with God. A worker together with God. This is what we're all to be. We're all to be servants and all to be serving. And we'll all stand someday. We are all going to give account. Why don't we just decide right now to surrender all we are and have to Him and work together for Him because His work is an eternal work. His work's not in vain. May the Lord help us by faith to do that. Maybe some folks today just need to slip out of your seat and come and say, Lord, I want to help. I want to be a co-laborer. I want to work together with you. Help me, God. Give me faith. Help me to surrender some things I know I need to. Help me, Lord, just to... Do what I can, find my place, do my part. And really, if there's anything we can do, it's just in surrendering all to Him, having faith in Him. Well, we pray in Jesus' name now, you'll continue to do your work in every heart and life. Uh, Lord, may we all be obedient to you. And uh, Lord, we just pray now that you'll minister to every heart. Those that need salvation, give them clarity, faith, and understanding. And Lord, we just pray that God, each of us, uh, we'll see what a great privilege we have that someday we can stand before you as having been a worker together with God. We just pray your way be done in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and turn to page 282, hymn number 282 in the hymn book, 282. Now let's sing that first verse together. If you need to slip out of your seat to come, you come. But let's sing together on the first verse. <laughs>
second verse, verse number two. Verse, verse number five. Just, Just. It's good to be here today. Don't forget about uh, tonight. Uh, the children are practicing their program. Are there any other practices or anything tonight going on before church? Church at 6 o'clock. So come back and be here. And then our fellowship afterwards. Don't forget about that. And then we want you to be here for that. So uh, we're thankful for a good day. Let's pray together. And uh, we're going to be done and be finished up here for this morning. Uh, Brother uh, Josh, just dismiss us in prayer, please. Thank you.